Welcome back, everybody. I'm very, very excited about this week's podcast. We have Kubus Fraser. He's the first chartered accountant I could get on the show. So today is really interesting. And yeah, you know, this podcast is all about the diversity of everybody in the industry. And I'm very privileged to have Kubus Fraser with us uh, today. Kubus, good morning. How are you? Morning, Christy. Yeah, going fantastic here. Thanks for having me on your podcast. I'm looking forward to the discussion. Yeah, me too. And you are not the typical chartered accountant. You, you, you're you a mining chartered accountant and you're in the mining space. And just for our listeners and our viewers, you know, I'm an engineer and as engineers, we are known to be left brain people that are not very people orientated people. And from the moment I met Quibus for the first time, it was definitely not your your typical chartered accountant that just it's all about numbers and it's all about systems. He was so he is so focused on people. And I guess that's why he has been successful in starting up a, a consulting company with another partner for yeah, since 2016, Quibus? Uh, yes, 2016, correct. Yeah. yeah. And uh, but yeah, would you mind introducing yourself to our listeners and our viewers? And tell us a bit about yourself, Gubas. Perfect. So, yeah, firstly, definitely not typical, Christy. Um, my wife, she's also a CA, and she said I've, I've left the accounting side behind. I can't refer to myself as a chartered accountant. I'm not a chartered consultant or anything. I could use the A for anything else, but not accounting. Uh, that's her perspective. Uh-huh. But, um, yeah, just kind of. Taking me a few years ago, I was uh, kind of raised in Folksrest. I grew up there. It's a very small town on the border of Natal and Pumalanga. I uh, grew up with two brothers, a younger brother and a twin brother. Um, if you say, so if I don't greet you in the streets, Christy, you know why. Um, I didn't know that. <laughs> so much different career paths. Uh, he's farming blueberries in the Eastern Cape or as he refers to it as uh, the Southern Cape, it's close to Corredo. And uh, every now and then I also pretend that I'm farming and that I know what I'm doing there. And I'll give him a call after dropping the kids off or on the way back from work and then kind of uh, just check in. So, so that uh, I really enjoy as well. Okay. Um, but studied uh, BCom Accounting at Tux, um, met my wife there. We've got uh, two kids. Uh, My son is five years old. My daughter is three years old. Uh, Really enjoying them. Um, So when my clients uh, and my colleagues don't keep me busy, they do. So it's it's a fun uh, process or experience. Um, Yeah, so after I studied to become accounting pre-grad and and honours, like most people who follow that route, uh, I did my audit articles or at one of the big four audit firms. And I was one of the guys who didn't really find much joy in it. Um, I was fortunate to audit companies in a, a range of industries, ranging from manufacturing, retail, logistics, um, uh, and, and mining, obviously, as well, some services companies. Um, and I think the reason why I struggled with it was because I, it was kind of like it got stuck in the past. Because yeah. uh, audit refers to reviewing uh, well, past uh, results, basically, making sure that the results aren't misstated. There's a very small component where you actually are required to, to be forward-looking. And yeah. um, one of my customers was uh, Exoro. So okay. every, uh, I'd say, yeah, November and December, uh, January January and February, every year, I, I had the opportunity to go to Grote Geluk Mine in Alice Ras or Lepanali. And I just loved being there. Uh, the culture was amazing. The people were amazing. Um, and they were just always talked about strategy. They were, uh, whether they talked to you or the, whether you overheard a conversation in the passages, they were always talking about how they were going to improve, how they're going to cut costs, how they're going to improve efficiencies. And I just thought if this is what mining is about, then I want to be part of it. So that's, that's, so 
I don't think many people know about it. Definitely not the guys at Exoro, but Exoro <laughs> basically got me into mining. So um, amazing, yeah. Wow. And uh, so after uh, my articles, um, I wanted to kind of enter into the mining space, but I wasn't too sure how or where or, and those type of things. So I Deloitte, uh, joined Deloitte Consulting in the um, uh, strategy and innovation department. And um, I'd, say, I'd say about 95 plus percent of the work was in the mining space. Had the opportunity to travel a lot, uh, really learned a lot there. Uh, great leadership, great team members, um, fantastic experience. I think that's when I ran into you the first time many years ago when you were still at London, I think. Yeah. And um, that's also where, uh, when I met Rob McGill, uh, my colleague, um, or business partner. Um, at that stage, he was still at TWP. And um, one of our customers uh, gave many of their capital projects to TWP, or well, basically Rob's department um, to run with. And I was uh, on the review team, um, just checking for, well, as much as a CA could in that time to kind of try and make sure things are going to happen the way they planned for it. So Rob and I were on the opposite ends of the table. Um, I tried to convince him that his team's valuation results were wrong or, or, or forecasts. And <laughs> he tried to convince me that I knew nothing about mining. And I think there was some truth in, in both uh, statements or arguments, but we, we got along well. And um, sorry, you still there, Chris? I yes, 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 I am. Sorry, I'm, I'm listening intently. Sometimes people think I'm not there anymore. <laughs> or the screen is frozen and something went wrong with the data. Now I'm absolutely yeah. fascinated. So, uh, yeah, so we, we arm wrestled a lot, um, but a lot of fun, uh, great experience. And um, at some point, Whirly Parsons acquired TWP. Uh, so Rob moved over to Whirly. Uh, one of my ex-colleagues was also there at the time and they asked me to join them to um, assist them with various things they envisaged at that stage. Um, so joined Whirly, and I think that's where... Um, I really got to feel what mining was all about. Because, um, well, at that, that stage, the majority of Whirly South Africa was basically TWP. Okay. And the guys there had 20 to 30 years more experience that I, than I had. Um, they were very uh, kind of, of discipline orientated or focused. So you get guys who designed platinum plants for his whole life or someone who was exposed to shaft sinking a, a lot and those type of things. So I really um, uh, had the opportunity to broaden my horizons there. Um, I think I met more people in the six, first six months at Worley than I did in my entire wow. um, career before that um, from all over the world. So that was, that was quite fun. Um, yeah. So Rob and I rubbed more and more shoulders and uh, kind of, um, understood how I kind of the, the, the different uh, each person's thinking works and uh, there was a very good fit. Um, there were a few opportunities, uh, I think, in the market that we were not really able to tackle in Whirly. Um, but it's obviously a, a massive global organization, um, uh, very focused on oil and gas back then as well. So we thought that we wanted to do things a bit differently and uh, go for opportunities that we couldn't necessarily go for. And that's how Fraser McGill started. Wow. That's a story. I, it, I mean, we also in the space this morning that when we're talking about entrepreneurship and you, I know you've done your MBA and where did this entrepreneurial thing start with you? Um, I think it's a gradual process. I think when I was younger, um, I always thought, well, where are the opportunities? Because I, I can't find them. There has to be something. And as you kind of grow and as you interact with different people and, and different customers, at some point, you, you, you kind of reach a stage where there's too many opportunities. So there's not enough time or money to go for them, but there's so many opportunities. And I think that's where um, I think my ch thoughts and kind of you know, the, the way I saw the world changed a bit at Whirly. 
because it was a very tough time for mining. And yep. generally, in my time at Deloitte, especially when you review projects, uh, there's a big focus on identifying risk, a big focus on making sure things are robust and that you can, whatever you commit to your shareholders, you'll be able to achieve. But generally, when you've got a, a risk mindset, you end up with having less value because it's so easy to identify risk and it's so mm. easy to quantify risk. And every time you quantify it, the value reduces. Mm. But because of the, the place where the industry was during my time at uh, Worley, you were forced to think about the upside and that's much mm. more difficult. You were forced mm. to find the opportunities. You were forced to find ways to make progress progress. And that resulted in... Um, having to do things differently and approach things differently, design things differently, and just applying a, a new um, methodology to things, I suppose. Yeah. I don't know if that answers your question. It does. It does. I've, I've been on this journey myself for the last three years, and it is incredible when you open your mind to opportunities. As you say, you can be very risk-based focused. Um, and that just takes value from an organization and you just have this very pessimistic view or like you've done, the two of you, when you started this company, you, you see opportunities. Well, we're not tapping into this market. There, there is an opportunity there. But how difficult is it to actually then make that leap of faith? Um, I suppose it depends on your personality, Christy. <laughs> um, <laughs> so... Uh, I, as I said, I always thought, well, there has to be an opportunity. And uh, when the kind of opportunity came, I just thought I have to do it, whether it works or not, um, yeah. whether I kind of live through my pension in the next year, that's fine. It's safe. <laughs> well, nothing. What's the worst thing that can happen? And I'm happy with that worst case. And I think um, yeah. that's uh, that's uh, basically what would let me do it. Um it's I can't remember who said it, but it was uh, someone that said in the past the the best warriors were the guys who had a um, strong desire to live and a strange carelessness about dying. And I suppose the same thing is about starting a new business. You need to have a strong desire to make it a success, but also a strange carelessness about not making it. Um, mm. I think the taking the step was also easier because my wife was working um, yeah. um same profession just different industry yeah uh, that made it easier we didn't have kids at that point in time so um much less commitment yeah i think in your previous podcast someone spoke about um not kind of having too much debt i think that's very important yeah and don't live above your means but also don't live at your means um Keep your debt levels as low as possible. Uh, don't buy that new car. Um, just the best thing is not to spend your money. And if you don't do that, um, yeah. and an opportunity comes by, you'll be able to go for it. I think. Yeah. Yeah, those are very wise words, um, everybody. So, yeah, Kuvas. Uh, no, you still at a, you, you're still an accountant. You still talk about debt. <laughs> <laughs> although, although you've got this 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 very very fantastic passion about mining and and this morning I was like okay I just want to make sure I've I've got Kubis's history right and I was going on LinkedIn and I saw this photo that you you've got in your background this morning and you are definitely a passionate miner and I've 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 had the privilege of working only on one project with you and you certainly have amazing skills uh, people skills, but you know, you know, just well-rounded individual. What makes a good consultant? Because we're talking to call it a young Quibus, a young Krista, but more specifically a Quibus that's either an accountant um, at a mine or a job, you know, maybe the finance manager at the mine or the up-and-coming fan finance manager at the mine, or you know, the CFO, the up-and-coming CFO, or a finance person that has moved into the mining space and is now in consulting, what makes a good consultant? From a, a CA's perspective or just general, uh, Christy? You de you decide. <laughs> <laughs> I think from, uh, I'm not going to uh, talk too much about uh, what makes a good consultant from a CA's perspective, because I think ultimately it doesn't matter. Um, I think mining is so complex that, a single discipline 
or uh, whether it's uh, geotech or mining, metallurgy, uh, accounting, it, it's so complex, you can't fully understand everything. You can have a very good understanding of everything, but you'll never be a specialist in all areas. Yes. So I think what, well, let's just take it from when you maybe exit varsity. I think it's very important to become a specialist at something. And and not necessarily, I'm, I'm not saying you have to have a qualification. I work with guys who, who um don't have all the degrees that some others have and so forth, and they're just as good. Mm. Um, but I think it's important to differentiate yourself for yourself from others, and you do that by maybe studying something different or uh, getting the practical experience. I think that is super important. So I think when you're younger, you have to specialize in something so that there's something specific that people come to you for. And that would most likely ensure career progression in your, in your early days. But at some point in time, especially as you grow in your career and as you become more senior, there's a need to be more broad. Um, the more of the kind of soft and fluffy stuff need to come in. Um, yeah. Leadership and those things. Sorry, Krista, it's not soft and fluffy. It's important, but that's <laughs> as I refer to it as that. Non-engineering and non-technical related stuff that are very important. Yeah. Um, so, and I, I think what's important is to learn from others. It's important to diversify your knowledge base and your skills base. And once again, that doesn't mean you have to study something else. It could be as simple as listening to others in meetings. I mean, the project we worked on, Chris, to add all mine functions or discipline leads that you could have on a mining business in the same room. And mm. I mean, when it's not your turn to, to talk or to contribute, it's important to listen to the others and become familiar with the jargon, become familiar with what it means when the, the geotech guy talks or when the geologist talks, it, it may be a bit boring for you at, at, uh, depending on your, your own perspective, but yeah. it's important to learn from them. And um, I found that people generally like um, transferring knowledge. It, I think it makes them feel important and, and yes. better about themselves. So uh, I think it's important to, to contribute and to, to diversify yourself. So yeah. I think that's one of the things that make you a successful consultant, but also, that would make you successful in your career, even if you're sitting at a mine. Um, yeah. I mean, on this project, Krista, you could, you had the ability to contribute to all components of the study, whether it was in your kind of, uh, let's call it assumed or um, what we think your, your expertise is, or whether it's something completely different. You had the ability to contribute to absolutely everything. And that doesn't come automatically it comes from uh, putting in the effort um self-studying kind of reading up on things um keeping up with the latest trends it, it, it takes effort and that effort i think generally if you're a consultant your, your customers aren't going to pay you for putting in that effort yeah. and your employer will most likely not um kind of uh, tell you to put in the effort it's something that you have to do in your own time and it's most likely going to be after hours um, yeah. so I think that that contributes um, and I also think being a servant is what makes a good consultant it's not yeah. about you yeah it's it's about someone else it's about your customer it's about his or her business it's about mm. their shareholders and um, I think consulting is a very exciting uh, industry to be in, especially mining, because mining is so exciting. But you never the hero. You there to support. You there to serve. You there to make other people famous. Yeah. And I think if you can do that, then you'll you also um, do quite well. Yeah. Well, I hope if you're listening to this podcast or if you're watching on YouTube that you have, are making notes. <laughs> uh, that that is just an incredible piece of conversation that we've just had, Quibbers. Um, to our listeners, I, I don't, you know, I've been in this space a while, but what Quibbers has just told us is like, you know, you've got an MBA in, in three minutes there because that's really what, what this is all about. I'm, and I don't think it's different for consulting, Quibbers, that it's just us to do listen well, even if you're leading an organization or you're leading a team of people, 
and you are the finance manager, as an example, this morning, just being able to listen and keep an open mind and continue learning from others is just amazing. I've learned so much from the very first time I was a, I was a GM and, and I was working next to a CFO. Um, he taught me so much. And uh, there were times that we had very tough conversations in his office. And he said, Christo, you need to decide. Are you cost focused or are you production focused? And um and I and I and I said, okay, well, um, Gerbrand, um, I'm he says, no, 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 you've got foot, you've got your feet on both ends. You must decide w- what it is now. And you can't keep on flip-flopping and you know, you need to. But we had very tough conversations. And but it, after a while, I started listening and realizing that that it's all about working in a team and Coming back back to that principle, and you've just mentioned quite a bit of you know these geotech people, women, men, um, a diverse team. And I know at, at Fraser McGill you also have a yeah, very diverse team that you're working actively on you know leveraging that diversity. How important is that for for your business working in a team? <clears throat> yeah, I think very important, Krista. And, and once again, because mining is so complex. I mean. Um, I went to a, a new uh, kind of greenfields business in the DRC a, a while ago, and, and the scale of it is so enormous, and you kind of become insensitive to it. And when you look at everything around you and you think, well, how, how, how is it possible for people to make this work? And because it's there's so many different disciplines, and, and, uh, and when I refer to disciplines, I mean accounting, mining, and all those kind of things, processing, yeah. and so forth. Um, you have to come together and you have to work as a team. Um, and I think that is critical. And the diversity comes from that. Even if it's in a certain department, the different mindsets, the different opinions, the uh, different backgrounds, all of it comp- contributes. I think in, in our business, because uh, we're still relatively small, we're about 50 people in the business, Um every person that joins the business changes the business because there's a unique element that that person brings in that wasn't there when that person, um, before that person joined. Wow. Um, and I think that that's, uh, for me, what, why I love uh, consulting as well and why I love working in teams because every person brings something unique to the table. And it's, as it, it's, it says, all the kind of MBA stuff that's important, all the, the once again, I'm going to say soft and fluffy stuff, but it's important. Um, sure. And I think diversity is part of it. And I think it's respecting other opinions. Um, it's about listening to others. But I think also giving people the responsibility and the opportunity to take lead of things and to kind of step away and say, well, um, whether I'm the project lead or not, I'm going to make something someone's problem because that that's how someone will learn from it. That's how yeah. someone will contribute in his or her own view. Um, but to do that, you have to allow people to make mistakes. Um, and through those mistakes, they'll, they'll learn and, I've generally, well, people don't like making mistakes. So if you give them the opportunity to make a mistake, they'll by themselves take the opportunity to do their best to fix it. So um, yeah. Yeah, I think diversity and teamwork for me is kind of integrated. It's almost the same thing. Yeah. But you're making so many amazing comments there. And, you know, once again, our listeners, I hope you're taking notes here because these 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 are life lessons that you know only comes from you know amazing experience and success. But Kubis, you you touch on that every new person coming to Fraser McGill changes the business. That means you highly value people, and if you create that environment where where people know that you value them, that that they have got the power to to shape your business, uh, they will embrace the culture they will bring their best to to the work every day they will you know be successful and as you say when they make them those mistakes they will quickly fix it and you know try and make up for that mistake and there's nothing that can compare with that sort of culture um i I wanna i wanna move on a little bit to um the failures (laughs) you've you've touched on that 
and I guess as entrepreneurs, one of the things we 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 live by is we, you know, we we learn, you know, we we win some, we learn some. Uh, so we never see a failure as necessarily a setback, but it's an opportunity to grow and learn. Any big failures or lessons learned that you're willing to share and be vulnerable about this morning? Yeah, sure. Well, uh, I think I failed much more than what I've succeeded, Christy. Um, and I think it, it started in varsity. You can ask my wife or all my varsity friends. <laughs> 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 I failed more than I passed. So, But um, I think perseverance was absolutely critical. I mean, studying for something and, and failing and studying harder and failing again and then studying harder and differently and failing again and, and you fail and fail and fail until you don't. Um, yeah. And I think that perseverance and the willingness to go the extra mile um, kind of changes those failures into success. Um, but I mean, from a, a consulting perspective um, and, and business in general, you, you can have your own plans, but the world is out of your control and it's mm. so fast moving and it's so volatile. It's sometimes difficult to know whether something that you want to do, whether it's going to work or not. I mean, yeah. it makes sense on paper, it makes sense financially, but it's the wrong timing. The opportunities aren't there. Yeah. Um, and, and sometimes a great idea doesn't progress just because of timing in the market or the opportunities aren't necessarily there. And, uh, I suppose you, you you shouldn't just leave it. I mean, you need to be hard on it and just drop it if it doesn't work. I mean, in the early Fraser McGill days, we were very open to do many different things. And um, I was quite critical, especially about myself, to say, well, um, to what extent does this contribute to the business? To what extent does it contribute to our growth, to our clients, to our people, to the bottom line? And if something didn't work, if whether it was 99% done or whether we just started, I would drop it. Um, okay. It doesn't matter how passionate I was about it. Um, and I think that that helped a lot. Not getting, um, I don't know, almost emotional or too stuck in things you think you want to do. Okay. Um, and that opportunity may come back. It's still a good idea, mm -hmm. but when the opportunity comes, you, you can you can go back to it. Um so, so many failures there, but ultimately they lead to um, betterment or improvement of everything around you. Um, but I think if I have to think about failures in the business or for myself personally, I think the biggest area where I feel I fail is where someone leaves the business or leaves the team. Sure. And, um uh, luckily that not a lot of that has happened um but f for me it feels like um you failed him I, I couldn't i couldn't give the person what that person needed in mm. what his or her career plan was so uh for me that's that's a failure um but i mean we'll get them back in the future the winding industry is small um no. we, yeah we we let them go and do their thing and hopefully they'll come back so yeah you share something that is very close to my own heart. And I feel we've got a just just by you saying that, you know, we've got this special bond between us because every time somebody in my team resigned or was busy looking, and actually, you know, I think from about 10 years ago, I would say when I get to a new team, if you have plans to go somewhere else, I want to be the first to know because it either is that I'm not creating that environment for you to be successful. Or at least if I, you know, if I failed you, I would want to understand where I failed you. And you just saying that, you know, you've, that is, you know, that's something that's very close to your heart means to me. You know, yeah, It shows me that how successful, you know, you've just started out with this company, you and Rob, and, and, and I can only see that this will just go places because that sort of attitude towards people is just amazing. Um. Thanks for sharing that, Gurbis, and being, being vulnerable about that. Uh, you've mentioned so many things about, you know, success factors and the key, call it the call it the, the key success factors to running a successful business or consulting business. What would you say to 
to an accountant out at the mine that is just running the numbers, scrunching the numbers, you know, providing the, the information to different departments, maybe to maintenance or to engineering, like some companies call it, or to production mining or, you know, to procurement. What would you your advice be to somebody that's, they, they, they're not in the best place of mind, they're not really enjoying this. Um, how do they, how do they get energy back in this wonderful world of finance? Yeah, I think, um, and I think also quite kind of leads to our previous discussion. We say, well, what will make you successful in consulting? Um, I found from my own perspective, and also when I look at our business, some of the younger guys, um, when you're under pressure and there's deadlines and things to do it's very easy to get stuck in the detail you've got your head down and you just kind of push through and from a finance perspective you, you're crunching the numbers and you you get the deliverable out and and you kind of move on to the next thing but you never kind of paused and stepped out of the detail whether it's during or after you completed the work and say well does this make sense Mm. What does the information tell me? So it's the yeah. almost asking, well, so what? Um, so after you've completed the work, I think the so what question is important to say, well, we've got these results, but what does the data tell us? What mm. does what does it mean? Is it what we expected? Is it better? Is it worse? How's it going to change going forward? Um, and, and that kind of also ties into understanding what happens around you. So if the... Um, Planning department says they're changing the cutoff grade. How's that going to influence you? Yeah. If they say they, uh, there's a new plant being constructed, it's going to be further away or closer to the mine. How does it influence you? Yeah. Um, someone talks about the stresses underground needing more uh, uh, secondary support or primary support, backfill. So what? What does it mean? Um, and I think asking the so what is important. And for me, that makes it exciting because I don't – do well if I don't see the bigger picture. So I think you need to pay attention or, or uh, take the time to understand the bigger picture. And uh, also while you're doing the work, um, sometimes you just kind of crunch the numbers and, and get through it. But is that the most efficient way to do it? Is it fit for purpose for what you're trying to achieve? Um, I've seen on minds where People work with um, management reporting templates that are 10 to 15 years old. And <laughs> you, you populate it because that's the template that needs to go in. But when you ask people, well, what information do you use in this report? There's many things in there that's not used or it's duplicated effort or it's a manual process. Um, and I, I think you spoke to me, was it Pit from Mine RP? Um, big focus on on digital stuff. There's always a way to optimize, to automate. Um, so so try and find ways to do the donkey work faster or more yeah. efficiently, so that you've got more time to analyze the business. And for me, that's more exciting. Yeah. Sure. And also, I believe your colleagues. I mean, they would also enjoy it if you contribute to what they do. If you say, yeah. "Well, this is what I see here," there's a massive buildup in stock whether it's uh rom dumps or work in progress or finished goods um this influences our balance sheet it influences our profit maybe um what can we do about it and, yeah. and that impact will i think also be beneficial to other people yeah oh that's oh that's that's really great insight and and i can just you know also just testify to exactly what you said the 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 the, the finance people that I've worked with over the years, the most, the ones I remember the most and that has made the biggest value to the business were exactly those type of people that they didn't just, you know, use the same report. They said, I've thought about this. Um, what would you, I've, I've given this a little bit of a revamp. What do you think about this? Would this help? Will, will this help us understand the better, the business better? Or they would join me on an underground visit and say, yeah. I want want to learn a little bit about, you know, this sub-level open stoping method or whatever that may, may be, or, you know, how does this work? And tell me about, take me with you when you go to the plant and, you know, tell, tell me what, you, what, what you're looking at. Why are, you, why are you asking these questions? Why is this important to you? What, what is it? And 
those people that I've worked with, they were also then just moving up in their careers because they they were valued and um, everybody was offering them jobs and everybody wanted them on their teams. And I think a lot just starts with ourselves. Um, Kubis, I'm I'm conscious of your time and you've you've given us so much of your time today. You you're running this company and you've got lots on 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 going on at the same time. Any final things that you know you thought of when when I invited you and you know I'm super super grateful that that you've you've been you know you said yes and I'll I'll be on the podcast. But any messaging or anything that you feel that we haven't touched on that you would like to. To, to still talk about or share with us? I think we can talk for many hours, Christy. So um, I think, well, that's maybe the final message is, is network. Spend time with your colleagues, spend time with your peers, whether it's in your own team or within your own company or with outsiders. Yeah, connect, learn, um, develop yourself. Uh, it's Mining is a great industry to work in. So, um, yeah, enjoy it and and... So if you want to come for a coffee or a beer, uh, any of your listeners, I'll, I'll gladly um, you take the time. So, um, yeah, looking forward to something like that. Thanks a lot, uh, Kuvis. And, uh, yeah, if people want to get hold of you, they probably just um, message you on LinkedIn and they'll find you there. Or, yeah, visit Fraser McGill. I think you're in Four Ways. Um, or, or, yeah, it's Four Ways. What, what, what's right. the in Johannesburg? Yeah. So thank you very much, uh, Kubis. It's been it's been such an energetic conversation and making making or getting to know you at a deeper level. Thanks for sharing and being vulnerable and sharing your life story with us as well as the successes and failures. Uh, we wish you all the best. I know this 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 business of yours is just going to go from strength to strength, and we wish you all the best. Thanks a lot. Thanks, Chris. It was great talking to you, and uh, we'll catch up soon. I'll see you in the field. <laughs> yeah, thanks, Kubis. That was amazing. I enjoyed this conversation so much with Kubis today. Uh, just as per usual, we recap the lessons learned for us. In terms of success and building a business, have a strong desire uh, to make the success that you want it to be but also have the, the strange carelessness if you don't. As a consultant, he says, when it's your time to contribute, um, that's your time. When it's not, make the effort of learning and listening from the other disciplines. Number three, being a servant makes a good consultant. Number four, you are there so that your client can become the hero. It's not about you. Number five. He looks at every person coming into his organization as changing the shape of that business. And finally, it's so important to ask the so what when you're finished off a piece of work. Thank you very much for listening. Thank you for watching this week. We'll see you next week. Happy mining. Cheers. Cheers.